So uh, how long how long have you been playing, man? Uh, I got my first guitar from a Sears catalog when I was ten, and I don't, I won't say I played back then, but I had a guitar. Right. And uh, when did you really start taking it seriously? Probably in college. That's how you got the chick. <laughs> <laughs> Just being honest. Man. <laughs> nice. That's when I started really playing, and then uh, of course I we have three daughters, and when the last one graduated high school, I really started gigging hard, like 60 to 100 gigs plus working a full-time job. But I, you know, before that, I play one or two a month. But uh, I would say I really started taking it seriously about 2000. And How old were you then? I was probably close to 40. Uh, started taking it serious. About 40. And I'm 57 now, and I play gigs every weekend. So yeah. I live my dream. Awesome. Now, uh, introduce yourself, like your name and, and where you're from and everything. <clears throat> my name is Jeff Blackburn, and I'm from the hills of eastern Kentucky, a little town called Hellier, which is about 30 miles outside of Pikeville City. So we we were, to say the least, we were rural. <laughs> and I grew up like that. And I wrote a song that you can find on my website, jeffblackburnmusic.com, called Hard Times, because I didn't know I was poor until I got to college. And someone was <laughs> kind enough to point it out to me. Wow. I just, it, I, I wrote it because it Looking back, it was growing up in hard times in a cold camp, a bottom, whatever you want to call it back there. But I didn't know I was ha I was living in hard times. It was just times to me. So I wrote a song called "Hard Times Are Just Times." Check it out on the website, and yeah. uh, and it talks about growing up there in the coal mines and what's there now, which is the epidemic of opioids. Mm. And if you didn't uh, yeah. if you didn't leave there, you're never going to leave. You're you know? stuck. Yeah, you're stuck. So. Mm. I was fortunate to get out in 1984 when I went to EKU, and uh, then I got a job out of EKU, and I've been at the same job for 34 years now. And what, yeah, what is your uh, your I'm a, day to day? I'm a senior te technical communications specialist, and that's that's a fancy title for saying I I deal in communications every day. But my main job is creating content for operations manuals for cranes. And uh, I write all the operators' manuals that go in our link belt cranes, and do all the three D graphics and make all. I do all. That. I love it. Heck yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I guess I have to to be there that long. <laughs> True, but it is a very, very intriguing, cool job. It's never the same day. You don't have the same day twice in a row. Yeah, I bet. Oh my goodness. And I, I bet you're sick of reading your own writing. I can't read for <laughs> pleasure anymore. Yeah. <laughs> like my wife, she reads probably two or three books a week, like full books. When I get home, I don't want to read anything. I want to watch TV or go play music. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, you said it was living the dream, and that's what it's like being a musician. Um, so what kind of music are you into? I play mostly songs I write, but the genre that I would say I'm in is bluegrass and Americana. Mostly Americana, but now I've been in several bluegrass bands. I've had several of my own bands. But I would say my music is more Americana. Hmm. Folk grass. Nice. So, yeah. Well, uh, what is it like making those songs? Like, what is your creative process like? I'll tell you, my process might be different than a lot of people's. I never sat down to write a song. 
like the song I wrote called Chasing Buckles, which is, you can download all my music for free on my website. Cool. I don't charge for it. I just want people to listen That's to awesome. it. That's awesome. Wow. And uh, if you like it, put it on your device and enjoy it. And if you don't like it, make CDs, give it to people you hate. <laughs> Christmas is just around the corner. But anyways, the song uh, Chasing Buckles, <laughs> it came around, That's me and my wife, Jen, we watched this series on Netflix called How to Be a Real Cowboy with this guy named Dale Brisby. And we watched the whole thing in one night. I was fascinated by it. And then I woke up the next morning, and I wasn't planning on writing a song, but I just got to thinking about how those people out there that ride the rodeo, they don't really care about the money. They want them big buckles. So the song's called Chasing Buckles out on the circuit. So check it out, and uh, just that's my creative process. Awesome. I'll get an idea for a song, and I mean, I'll... Like, I keep a lot. Like, if I think of a good line for a song, I put it in my notes. Nice. <clears throat> but I still don't come back to that. I'll go in there looking for maybe phrases that might fit in a song that I've thought about at work or whatever when I should be working. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll make those notes. But I just wake up with these thoughts in my head, and I try to just write a song around them. Nice. Yeah, I, a lot of people in Nashville, 10 o'clock, they meet with other people, they drink coffee, they write songs. I'm not, I've never tried that. So I don't know how that would work for me as far as a, a process goes. Right. It, that that kind of makes it sort of a job. Yeah. If you wake up and some of them get paid song. quite well at their job, so they probably like it and a they lot. They can do it well. Yeah, know. I mean, that's what they do. Thank you. I was going to ask you, what you uh, going back to your first like public gig, do you remember when that was? Yes. What was that like? It was very terrifying. <laughs> yeah, it is. And before that, I had been like a worship leader at a church and helped with church music, but it's different. Those people are going to love you no matter what you do, you know. <clears throat> so my first gig, my first official gig was Ramsey's Patio in Lexington about yeah. 2000. And I was playing for the Parrot Heads, which are Jimmy Buffett fans. And I love Jimmy Buffett stuff. So I thought, you know, this would be a good group to kind of get my feet wet on. <clears throat> I played the gig for tips. Nice. And I advised, if, you, if you're starting out, that's okay. But if you put, money, uh, put time and effort into your craft, Get paid because the venues are getting paid because you're there. <laughs> but that's a side note, public service announcement. But I remember being terrified. You know, it was me and a guitar and a drum machine wow. and a Roland AC60, which is right there. I still have it today. My very first solo setup, you know. That's so cool. And, I've uh, seen guys on YouTube do that, man. Yeah. It's so awesome. And, you know, once I got through the first probably five songs and I knew nobody was throwing anything at me. This is going to be all right. <laughs> you were more comfortable. Yeah. But, you know, and, and like everything yeah. else, is, is, is as you gig and you get more experience, you, you, you really look forward to it instead of getting the, you know, the butterflies of nervousness, you get the adrenaline butterflies. That's the best. Right. You know, and I played on the stage. I played at so many venues from patios to Renfro Valley. I played in Nashville several times. Yeah. The time that I get up and I don't feel that nervousness, that, that adrenaline, I'm going to quit. It'll be my last time because I love it. I love that feeling. Yeah. Because when you entertain people, you have something they're never going to get back. You have their time. It's very important. They can, they can get money back. They can get their possessions back. They will not get time back. So what you do with that two or three hours, think about that. You know, Plan your set. Talk to people. You know, Be friendly and, and uh, connect. It's all about connection. You connect with the crowd, you can't get enough of that feeling. And there's several venues that I play in my rotation that the people, they come to see us because we've developed that relationship with That's them. That's awesome. And, That's what music's all about. Yeah. It's community. Yeah, well, you know, you go to jams all the time. Yeah. You know those people, they're, they're the best people in the world. I know. And, and they will never judge me. No. Yeah. They're just like, come on and play. Let's go. Yeah. So... You know, musicians are, are a different breed. I agree. Thank you. So you said you play shows every weekend now? That's yes. how often you play? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And do you, what groups are you part of right now? Are you solo right now? I'm, uh, I do a lot of solo <coughs> bands, uh, or solo gigs, but I have the Jeff Blackburn band. But what we do is, there's me, if it's a solo gig, there's me and my banjo and dobro player, Steve Maynard. We've been playing for so long that my dad, when he was alive, called him number four, the fourth son. I mean, he's been around my family, and he plays banjo and dobro, so we'll go do duo gigs. If the money's enough, then we'll bring the stand-up bass player. And then I have a harmonica player. who's the best harmonica player I've ever heard. His, his name is Joseph Zwischenberger. 
He's a retired heart thoracic surgeon. And he, does, he doesn't care if he gets paid or not. He's doing okay. Yeah. <laughs> but he is incredible. I met him officiating weddings. Uh, I, met, I officiated his daughter's wedding, and we just struck up a friendship. He's like, man, I used to be a bluegrasser, and I saw your website, and I love your music. I'd like to play for you sometime. I said, well, you know, I'd love to hear your harmonica. He had one at the wedding re rehearsal in his pocket. So we're standing he in the really parking plays. lot, he and really he plays. was honking that harmonica. And here comes his daughter with her uh, matron of honor or whatever. She looks over at me and, and Doc, that's what we call him, Zwish. And she goes, well, Dad's found another one. Musicians will find each other out. <laughs> we will. We will sniff each other out that's like awesome. dogs. <laughs> But, That's so true, man. I was at, I was working at GameStop, you know, uh, and some guy came and saw my guitar, and, and he was like, "Hey, man, can I play it?" And I got his number, you know. It's that yeah. simple. <laughs> Friends for life. Yep. Musicians. Smell each other out. That's awesome. <laughs> what would you say some of your biggest influences are? Like my in dad. Music? My dad was in this. There's a picture of him here. You guys can't see it on the radio or the, <laughs> the interview, but that's my dad's on my wall. Him and John Prime and Guy Clark are my biggest influence in my music. So my dad was in the same Southern Gospel Quartet for like 40 years. I mean, it was crazy. And then dementia took him. <coughs> and uh, But until the day he couldn't get on stage and remember the words, but he played as long. There's a picture of me sitting in his guitar case when I was like two, just listening to him and my uncles play. And my dad's last name is Blackburn like mine. And my uncles were Turner, so they had the Blackburn Turner overdrive instead of the Bachman Turner overdrive <laughs> from the 70s. I think they ripped that name off. No, they, <laughs> but they would play in between church services on Sunday because in the mountains, you go to church in the morning and you go to church in the evening. And that's just what you do on Sunday. And in between, everybody, because everything up there is about family, gets together and eats dinner. And then the old dudes sit out on the porch and play music. And uh, it was a super influence on my life. It sounds dreamlike. It really then, sounds... Yeah, it was it was crazy. I'm telling you, man, it was just the best childhood I could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, there's several artists that influenced me. It's like I said, get John Prine. COVID took him out. Unbelievable, really? great songwriter and musician. And uh, I'm on a lot He's of my well shows. Known. Yeah, I'm on a lot of my shows around his. And then Guy Clark is just one of the best songwriters I've ever heard. And there's another cat that not a lot of people know of, named Slade Cleves. I tell you, he can write some songs. Oh my gosh. Where's he out of? He's, he, he's out of the, <coughs> the Northeast, but now he lives in uh, Kerrville, Texas, I think, somewhere in Texas. He's, <laughs> he's moved out there because it, that's the genre, the Texas red dirt music. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he's kind of in that crowd now, so him and his wife Karen moved out there. So is Texas music like regional, <clears throat> I guess? It's, it's, it's called red dirt music. If you haven't heard of it, All of Google Texas. it. Okay. It's Texas Red Dirt, and it's definitely different, and I love it. <coughs> I love Red Dirt music. There's a, there's a, uh, Zach Bryan lyric, he yeah. says, I, I used to roll around in that red dirt mud. Is that what he's talking about? Probably. Talking about Texas? Probably. Probably. <laughs> Zach Bryan, man, what a great yeah. artist. Oh, I love his songwriting and his singing. Great, great yeah. artist, man. I'll tell you what, uh, there's not many guys doing it like him, but the guys who are are successful. It's, yeah. it's catching back on. I don't know if you've noticed, man, but you know Tyler Childers is one of the most well-known artists now. Just a guy from Eastern Kentucky. A guy from Eastern Kentucky. Yeah, yeah. playing yeah. songs, and yeah. you know, I've I've heard his music since he started, and and really enjoyed it. <coughs> but I like it best when it's just him and a guitar. Yeah, it's like he's just no sitting in your stuff. living room, yeah. playing those songs like "Nose to the Grindstone," and and his Tom, voice has yeah. so much emotion and power. Whew, man, you can tell he's been doing it for dozens of years, probably. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's probably all he's ever really done, you know. And uh, yeah, yeah he used to have a house in Estill. I mean, I've been th through Estill. It's dead as heck. And there's yeah. nothing out there. I think he still lives there. A uh, guy used to be my office mate. His farm backs up to Tyler's, where wow. he lives, and he takes care of Tyler's meals and stuff. Huh. When Tyler's and Sonora are out on the road, wow. So he just takes care of his farm for him because it's right next to him. That's awesome. And, uh, so that's pretty cool, man, that is to have that kind of connection. But I love people like Tyler who write their own songs. Yes. He'll play like that old bluegrass song, Rock Salt Nails, or something like that. But for the most part, he's promoting his own stuff, man. And I admire that. Because a lot of venues and stuff you play, it's cool. important if you're playing curtain venues, like you're on the stage and people are there to listen to music, you can play your own stuff and people are going to love it. 
if you're playing a winery or a brewery or a distillery. Somewhere more professional like. Well, then people want to drink and sing along. Yes. You know, they want to hear, you know, take a load off Annie or, you know, all those. Tell Yeah, yeah just yeah, anything yeah, that stuff. they can slur along to. And, you know, have, have a good time. in that group, yeah. <laughs> But it's okay, you know. Yeah. You just got, like I said earlier, you got to know your crowd. Exactly. You got to know who you're playing to. Yeah, man. So if you go to a, a, over here, I play at Maiden City a lot. You go over there and play your own songs. They're tuning you out. You wow. play uh, old Hank songs that they can sing along to. They're right there. Tip right. jars full before you leave. You gotta know <laughs> you gotta your crowd. Your crowd. You gotta read your crowd. I mean, you know, I can definitely see that being a big part of playing live. And a lot of times, what I'll do when I'm playing venues, especially that I don't know, <clears throat> is I'll look at some friendly faces and ask them, "Hey, what do you guys listen to?" The the number one answer. We listen to a little bit of everything. I was like, "You're, <laughs> you're my crowd." Because, you know, my solo shows, I play everything from bluegrass to bucket and anything in between. Cool. So you, you wait and see what lands with them, and then you continue on that vein. That's what fills the tip jars up. Nice. These are words to live by, man. You got to read the crowd. <laughs> you got to read the crowd. You know, I, I already kind of do that amongst my friends. I always ask them, like, even my friends, like, what do you guys like that I play? Because <laughs> they hear all my solo ones, you know, that I play around so you really got to read the crowd. That's, that's awesome. Now, uh, when it comes to writing music, do you think you could give advice to somebody else who is writing music, if you had any? Yes, I could, but I would say this isn't the way, this isn't the right or wrong way. Mm -hmm. This is my thoughts on it. And me and a buddy of mine named Ralph Reisman, we'll write songs and we'll send them back and forth to each other and say, man, what do you think about this? Awesome. Or my, my big brother, Brian, he writes a lot of songs. He lives down at Pigeon Forge. And I'll cool. send him a song, and, and I was like, "No, I can't get, the, I can't get this last line." And he'll send it back to me, and it's just <clears throat> like we were saying. That musicians are different, man. We just we'll help each other out anytime we can. I don't know. It's kind of like your Harley crowd or your Jeep crowd, or every. They all have their niches of people that they click to. Very musicians true. click with musicians. That's something I've discovered throughout college and stuff. Like I have friends from high school, and. Yeah, we don't hang out as much anymore because they're gravitating towards different things and I'm gravitating towards music. And so I'm going to find my crowd through music and they're going to find their crowd through their own thing. That's just how it works. That's what happens though as you grow up. Yeah. And especially right now at your age where you're young, you're, you're picking something you're going to chase your whole life. Oh, yeah. It's never going to go away. I quit for six months when I was playing bluegrass gospel. I bet that does Late get old, night. I'll be honest. Huh? I bet that does get pretty old. It, it does. it's the same old songs. Well, it, it's the same song, different words. You know, yes. eight, we call them 80 songs. A, D, and E. You know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> 80. But, uh, yeah. you know, I did that in the 90s before I started gigging out and stuff. And, uh, That's funny. I quit for six months. I just, I said, I'm never playing again. Wow. It was all right. So what was, what was the decider that made you just want to quit? We played like a hundred and something gigs and worked full-time jobs, you know, churches and so different things. So you couldn't venues. breathe? No. So I needed a break. So I just sold See? all the equipment and I was like, I'm never playing music again. Well, Do you regret that? No. That, that let me it's kind necessary. of reset. Because I was burnt out. You know? So uh, it allowed me time to, to refocus. And then when I refocused, <coughs> I come back in with a different attitude on it mm -hmm. and I didn't have my own group when I come back in I joined a group kind of what you gotta do <laughs> yeah <clears throat> that way I wasn't doing all the booking of the shows and I carrying all the equipment the I just had to show up and like my guys right now I carry all the equipment <laughs> they show up they plug in let's go we don't practice we don't do anything uh -huh. like that we just wing it but they're great musicians so I trust them <laughs> but uh, back that's then a, that's an awesome feeling that you can just improv with like your, yeah. your team there's a guy that you play with down there uh, at the Solancha house called Will Padgett. His dad, Rocky, plays bass down there a lot. Oh, dude, Rocky, yeah. first thing he said to me when he saw me after five years, he said, who's this weird looking sucker? <laughs> I love him. It's <laughs> like, funny. Because oh, him man, and Steven so and guys, funny. they're just great people, man. <coughs> but Will is my, you know, I call him when I need somebody to fill in. Because he knows my songs, he's a great musician, and even the ones who don't know, he knows how to play music. He's got a degree in it, you know. Wow. So he, he graduated from the Appalachian Arts and Hyden, Program. Yeah. Uh, the music school. Yeah, Appalachian Music School. I've been school. thinking about doing something, uh, traditional music school or something like that, because I really gravitated towards folk music and stuff nowadays. Uh, there's, evidently, it's a great program, but that's, that's you know, right you got to have the people. And then there's one guy in Northern Kentucky. I've known him since he was born, because I played in a group with his dad. 
and he's probably one of the best musicians I've ever heard in my life. And he's, I don't know, he's probably 30 now. And uh, What's he, his name? Jonathan Eastep. He's got a Johnny Eastep band. But if I'm up north and I need somebody, he's the guy I call because he's one of those people that can just play any instrument, any song. So never heard it yet. Wow. When we were young, we were back in my days, I was probably in my 20s, he was just born maybe five, and he wanted to go on gigs with us, so he'd sit in the back, read newspapers. He was a geek, mm -hmm. five years old. I would be in the front seat with my mandolin, and I could just play notes, and I'd say, Jonathan, what note is that? Oh, that's a C sharp. Uh, that's a, he's like pulling that newspaper down, looking at me. Oh, that's a D, that's a D. It's a D minor. He can hear colors. He can hear every, he said every note has a color, and he sees the color, and he knows. I, I, I can't, but he's just one of those. He, We'll be playing, the whole yeah. band will be playing, we'll stop playing, and say, hey, your B string's a little sharp, you might want to back that down. All that music playing, he can pick out one string on one person's instrument. I would love to have it developed here like that. He said it's it's a blessing and a curse, because he can't, all the time. yeah, because he's like, I go in into a store and I hear an air conditioning humming, he's like, oh, that's a G major, you know, he's, he, he can't I've not identify. Before. I've done that before, but not, I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. He's a great guy, man. Great band. They do most of bluegrass and bluegrass cool. gospel. And he writes a lot of songs too. So I, I try to surround myself with songwriters. I I love that aspect of the game. I, I need that in my life. <laughs> really. That's why I've been trying to get that group of musicians at the college together because I know young people like to write songs. So I yeah. Want to get them together. Well, you know, young people your age got a lot to say, man. That's <laughs> true. You Especially know? nowadays. Right. Yeah. I mean, lots going on. Lots. So there's war. Anyways, uh, so you don't have any like formal training in music theory or anything like Absolutely that? Absolutely not. Just picking no, away? No. My dad taught me three chords and threw me a capo. It's like, you're on the road. So. <laughs> That's all you need That's in, all you in need. traditional bluegrass music. Three honestly. chords and a capo. And, uh, they made uh, music that was not simple, but easy for you to follow along. Yeah. <clears throat> his deal was, his biggest concern was when he would go play gigs with me and my dubro banjo guy, was did it have what he called an off chord in it? Like if it was a song in G and had C and D, did it have that E minor in there? The old guys called that off chord because it wasn't in the rotation of... So it wasn't normal to the Right, so they call that the off chord. Mm -hmm. that's, very in that's, that's very interesting. It speaks a lot to what the kind of music they play. Oh yeah, great man. Just phenomenal. Just great. <laughs> I, I was talking about if, if you were good at selling your instruments and you didn't. Was there any... Anything that you uh, you would change about your career, and why would that be? I don't, know. I, I don't know if I would change it. I would have liked to seen how it went. Uh, a couple of things that popped up. I'm getting to maybe have a chance to tour with one of the country bands, and they asked me to come and try out, but I did not. And that was something I always thought, you know. You wish you did. I don't know. I don't know how it would have worked out. Because it would, it would have been different, something right. you don't know. Right. And, but it was like, man, I don't know if I'll ever have this chance again. You, you didn't know? think about it afterwards. Oh, I thought about it, and I've thought about it ever since. But, you know, you can't live your life regretting that kind of stuff. You just, it's just the, every now and then a what if pops in your mind. And then uh, when I was going down to Nashville doing the Bluebird and the uh, Hall of Fame Lounge and all these songwriter events, I thought, man, if I moved down here, maybe I could do it because they won't they won't hardly let you in unless you live down there yeah I and uh, I thought maybe I should just move down here but again where I grew up so poor and I had that job I wasn't going to quit my job Can't. you know and now I'm just I don't chase it like I did as far as the songwriting goes I write songs for me I'm not trying to sell them to anybody you know if somebody their their BMI copy written and all that stuff if somebody wants to get one off of there and they want to put it on an album or something I'd be fine with that, you know. If you're making money on it, make me a little too, but yeah. it's not why I write them. So now I just write them for me. Hmm. Well, man, it was really good talking to you. You too, uh, sir. about all the questions I had. Um, very glad that I could get to know you more. Also. Yeah.